Hey everyone, it's Jim from Valves and More, an online vintage tube store. And today, in Tube Lab number 182, we're going to talk about what is probably the number one problem with tubes. Yep, you guessed it, noise. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. Well, Charles is back on Monday, so I thought, why not film in his lab while he's away? Actually, the real reason I'm here is his noise, setting, noise testing setup is located here, and he is one picky guy when it comes to screening for noise. In a minute, we'll actually take a look at how he tests preamp tubes for noise. And one little bit of housekeeping before we get into the, today's episode. Um, we're going to start shipping on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. It's just the store is so busy, um, it just makes sense to group the shipping on three days a, a week. It won't change very much for almost anybody because most of our orders come in on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and we always ship on Monday. So, um, And if your order comes in in the morning, Pacific time, uh, we're on Los Angeles time. Um, you're probably, for most people, we're probably earlier than you are, so you're well ahead of us in your day. Um, so if the order comes in at a reasonable hour in the morning, our time, on uh, Monday, Wednesday, or Friday, we'll endeavor to actually try to uh, get your order out on that day if we can manage it. Um, okay, so what is tube noise? What causes it? what causes it, what can we do about it, and what are the other noises that uh, might sound like tube noises, but in fact actually have absolutely nothing to do with the tubes. Well, we'll go over all of that today. Uh, I'm going to have to try to move along at a good pace, though, because there's lots to cover. And I have some nice tubes to show at the end of the show, so i um, got to save time for that. If your system starts to make some low, scratchy, crackly noises, there's a good chance you've got a noisy tube. And if you lightly tap on the chassis of the amp and you get a loud ringing in the system, that's microphonics out of control. All tubes are microphonic. It's just a matter if they are acceptably microphonic or not. And if your system has a hum, either 60 hertz, so that's down fairly low in the bass frequency, so that would be a mmm, or a hum, something like that, or 120 hertz, which is twice that, which would be up here, mmm, or multiples going on up, it most likely has a power supply, a design, or a ground issue. In the case of the power supply, if the amp is 10 or 15 years old or older, it's probably uh, the electrolytic filter capacitors that are gone bad, and one or more of them, and they'll need to be replaced. In fact, let me look on Charles's bench, and he's got a bunch of electrolytics here. Here's a small one. This is a little 47 microfarad, 450 volts. Notice that ele electrolytics all have polarity marked on it. This is uh, Nishikon, so this is a very good quality um, electrolytic. We use those in the kits, and here's one of the larger ones that we use. This is 390 microfarad, that's how you say a UF symbol, and 450 volts. This is a nice, powerful, high capacity, high voltage filter capacitor. Again, it's got its polarity marked, and again, it's a high quality Nishikon. That's all we use in the kit amps our high quality uh, components. In particular, we pay attention to the electrolytics because um, yes, the, the better manufacturers um, that we buy from can be very expensive, but the lifespan of an electrolytic from a cheap manufacturer can be very, very short and can cause a lot of problems fairly early in an amp's life and for no reason other than the manufacturer wanted to get a better price point and save money. And if you've bought our kits or you're thinking about buying our kits, you know that we put a lot of care and intention into the gear and that's the gear we run it. We're both audiophiles and that's what we run at home. So we don't want them getting noisy. We want them to sound the best they possibly can. We don't actually have 
any you know super premium version of our kits in our system. We actually run the kits as you would build them. So, um, <clears throat> yeah. So electrolytics, uh, especially in older amplifiers and preamplifiers, can be a, a, a main cause of problems. Um, grounding issues and capacitors, of course, have nothing to do with the tubes. So even though a good first guess is that your tubes are to blame, there are many, many other possibilities. And we'll try to run through as many of them as we can today. Okay, let's start with the easiest of the noise issues, microphonics, and how to safely test. And what is it? Well, microphonics is when a tube basically picks up um, external noise. It can be in the amplifier region or it can be in the room. Um, it can be as simple as you turning a switch and making a click and it picks it up and it, micro, it amplifies it and amplifies it and amplifies it as though the tube is a microphone. So hence microphonics, right? So the simplest way uh, to start testing if you think you have a problem is always, if you're going to do a live test, always be very careful. Set your volume at normal listening volumes or lower. Never put it on loud. And um, let's just pretend this is your piece of gear that a preamp or a power amp, whatever it is. You would just set everything up, let it warm up, and then you would just lightly tap on the chassis. Can you hear that? I'm not hammering it with a, you know, a big honking screwdriver. I'm just, uh, this is a little bamboo skewer. Uh, we use these a lot um, on our benches. And if the amp rings, or you do a, you can do a switch too, is a great way of testing for microphonics. If you do that and the whole system rings, you've got a problem. Now, you can also take something with a very, very low mass, like a little bamboo toothpick or a stylus brush, brush is what I use in the system. Um, and you can just lightly tap. Now, you're going to hear something probably you might hear a thunka thunka or a little tinka tinka. That's perfectly normal. Remember what I said, all tubes are microphonic. But if you do this and you get a loud ringing sound in your system and it sounds, you know, like the, the system's at full volume in the Grand Canyon <laughs> and the ringing just keeps on going, that's a microphonic tube. And that is a problem. So you should be able to, when you do this, it, a microphonic tube should ring the system. You should hear it. But be careful. Don't throw out a tube that is borderline microphonic thinking that you're doing a good thing. Some of the very best tubes ever made in the world. Um, I'm thinking of the early true vintage Mullard 12AX7, for example, are microphonic tubes. That's just the way they were made. And um, they walk the, the design and, and manufacture them walks this very, very fine line of being either too microphonic or being just barely acceptable. But sonically, they're fabulous. So don't throw out a tube because it's a little bit microphonic. You may be throwing out the very best sounding tube in your entire system. <laughs> okay, what's next? Well, every single tube that we, te that we test goes through a number of stages. First, it gets a visual inspection, of course, but then it gets an, a complete electrical test and we get our testing numbers documented on it. And if it passes that stage, Charles brings it over to his custom preamp uh, noise testing rig. Now, if it's that's for a preamp tube, so we can handle almost every common uh, uh, tube made on this rig. If it is a um, power tube, in most cases, we'll test it in an actual power amp. We have quite a few amps, and we can test most standard power tubes. And there we just live test it. We bring it up to a normal listening volume. We'll do a little gentle tap a tap to make sure that it's not microphonic, and we'll run it for a little while and listen to it. In this case here, what he did was he built a custom preamp with a lot of sockets and a really good stable cathode file follower stage. This is a 6N6P. So this tube stays here permanently. And he's got a whole bunch of settings. So he can set the bias. Let me bring it back to where it was. 
so I don't forget. And I've got a big chart on the wall here with dozens of tube settings. And he basically sets the operating point to the as close to the center operating point of the tube as though it was in a real circuit. So this is low noise. It's taken this topology of this design, the power supply, is taken from our preamp topology, which is low noise. It's a little different because it's a different kind of a preamp. And, um, and then he has, for amplification, he has the second prototype headphone um, kit amp. And he actually built two complete prototypes, the first one in two chassis. And I said, look, we had re rebuilt enough times that I said, we need a better platform that you can rebuild easily. And we ended up designing and building essentially a prototype that was a testing prototype platform. And this worked out brilliant. It allowed Charles to optimize the circuit. So the finished headphone amp won't look anything like this physically. It's in a beautiful chassis. <clears throat> in fact, uh, if I have a moment at the end of the show, I'll show you um, the circuit boards that have just come in. Yeah, I mean, he's, <laughs> he's away, but the, we're actually working on his project. Um, so at least the manufacturer of the PCBs was working away on his project. So a headphone amp by its very nature has to be very low noise. So that is a perfect amplifier to put in this rig. And of course, a pair of good quality uh, Sennheiser headphones and good low noise tubes at this stage. And he can hear everything. It's really quite neat. You can actually hear the expansion of the tube uh, electronics inside the glass as it warms up. If you want to freak yourself out, <laughs> you may have heard it in system. It's not, the, it's not that unusual, if, especially if you had the volume up loud when you were turning things on. It's not a sign of a defect. It's just normal. The, um, the metal parts have a different expansion rate um, than uh, the glass. So, and if you notice how tubes are made, this is the electronics inside are basically an insertion inside of a tube, right? So as they warm up, they can expand. And when they cool off, they can contract. Okay, well, I actually have um, some wonderful uh, Toshiba 6CG7s. These are labeled 6FQ7s. Uh, it's the same exact tube. It's just a different number for the same tube. You may have noticed that over the years, um, uh, the, the general uh, tube um, using public have leaned towards just simply using one number for a tube. A good example of this is the uh, vintage EL34, which was designed and, manu and made uh, by Phillips and Mullard, and um, Phillips owned Mullard, of course, going way back to the 1930s. Um, I think it was probably their first major tube manufacturer acquisition. They made many, many more over the decades. But um, And uh, so they named it the EL34 uh, in the late 1940s. I think 1947 they patented the tube. It was the first modern high-powered um, audio tube. And um, I mean, there were previous inventions of power tubes prior to that, but the EL34 really sort of hit a sweet spot of power and size and performance and price and sonics. I never forget about the sound of the EL34, which is my one of my favorite power tubes. But in the, in the US, they have another numbering system, so they call it the 6CA7. Well, these days we know that EL34 only as the EL34. And of course, the Soviets had their own numbering system and so on and so on. So a lot of people have, have leaned towards just simply working with one number. So the 6CG7 is how we know this tube today. And these Tocibos are fabulous. And we're actually going to, I got some more, quite a few more Japanese uh, Matsushitas in that are quite similar to the Toshibas. And we'll talk about those at the end of the show. But if we were to test these, this is a twin triode. We would just plug it into the nine pin. I would check my chart, I'd dial it in, and Bob's your uncle would be good to go. But this is basically an identical 
electrical tube to the 6SN7, except that it's in a miniature 9-pin bottle. So, hang on a second, let me see if Charles has an adapter on his bench. He does. Of course he does. <laughs> He's testing all different kinds of tubes every day of the week. Um, so you could, I, I could, he could, you could. This is how you would normally use this tube today. Plug it into a 9-pin to octal adapter and we could test it this way as well. That would work just fine. Now, our preference would be to put it over here, but can you tell it's spring? Can you see the little ant? We're, our house is filled with little ants. Well, it's not filled, but <laughs> they're everywhere. <laughs> little buggers. Anyways, um, so yeah. So this is a great way of, of testing for noise. Now, what are the other things that could actually be causing problems with your tube that's not actually internal to the tube causing the noise well your connections so a good quality socket this is the one we use on uh, the kit amps that have a pcb board for the socket and look at how these clamp onto the pins i call these a claw type so they actually make a little scratching uh, or mark as the pin goes in, they sort of scratch the surface a little bit. So they're always renewing the surface as they get inserted. These are fabulous. We have never have a problem with these. Here's another octal socket, another PCB type. This is very common out there and look how it's sort of a circular U type receiver. These are more problematic. They're not bad sockets, but they're not nearly as good as this type and the bad news is that the miniature nine pins and many other types need to use this kind of receiver because they just can't the smaller pins can't use the little claw type there's no way to build it that small and make it durable so nine pin tubes uh, can have more connection issues so um, pardon me so Cleaning the pins is a good first step if you've got noise on a tube. Cleaning the, the receivers is another good step. What else? Where else can you find noise in your system that sounds like a tube but is not a tube? Well, the contacts of your patch cords, both the uh, signal carrying center contact here and the ground return path. Remember, you've got to have at least two connections uh, to move a signal around. And if one of them has a problem, then everybody has a problem. <laughs> um, so yeah, and where these plug into can is a very, very common. So an RCA jack can get dirty it, and um, it can be easily cleaned on the outside. You have to do a little bit more work on the inside. I've done videos on how to clean these. So in the old days, I say the old days, the, the 70s, they don't seem like that old, but it was a half a century ago. When I was a young wannabe audiophile, we, everybody had basically a, a routine with their system. And we would, once a month, on the last day or the first day of the new month, we would unplug the system with it off, of course. We just unplug and we plug back in with maybe a little twisting motion, the whole system. And then once a year, we'd do all the contacts. We'd clean everything. It was just... People just did it. It was normal operating procedure. So, um, and it, that's been kind of lost these days because the the coatings and metallurgy of these uh, components has improved a lot since the 1970s. But oxidization is never rests, so it still can be a problem today. Okay, um, what what else? Well. If you're hearing sort of a pulsing noise in your system or a little digital noise, uh, something like that, well, it probably isn't anything to do with the tubes, the connections, your amps, preamps, nothing. It's probably electronic noise that's in the air around us. It, and in any, any modern home, um, your, the airway around you is absolutely filled with electronic noise. Now, most of it's very, very high frequencies and it doesn't cause problems. That's why it's up in those higher frequency bands. But there's noise off of transformers. There's noise off of cheap power supplies that might be powering up, you know, uh, some, some little component that you've got in the house. 
it, it can be almost anything. I mean, um, LED lighting is uh, famous for causing noise. And uh, it may not even be in your house that you got the noise. It could be next door. It could be in the power line. Um, somebody's got a really noisy device on um, your power system and it's making your system noisy. So, yeah, so it's okay to think about the tubes as being a possible cause of um, a noise, but keep your mind open because it, it may well be something completely different that has nothing to do with the tubes whatsoever or something as simple as just cleaning a contact. Okay, now, um, oh, I wanted to show you, um, just before Charles left on vacation, we actually finished the design of the production circuit boards for what will become uh, the uh, production, yep, the production kit headphone app. And here, is, this is the, um, the tube board. So it has, it'll have a, uh, um, it'll have a preamp and a power um, amp tube on a board. So this is one channel. So there's two of these per uh, per headphone amp because of course it's a it's an integrated stereo um, headphone amp as most are, and it's a double sided board. And Charles just does such an amazing job designing these things. We put them on the heaviest material. The manufacturer can give us the heaviest traces, nice big pads. This, of course, is the side that the sockets go on. Um, and wait until you see the power supply board. It's just massive. It's one of the biggest boards. It is the biggest board that we've ever put in a kit. And the reason why it's so large is because it's going to be a quasi dual mono power supply. And when we uh, introduce the kit as a finished uh, entity, we'll go over in detail how this is a quasi power supply, but essentially what we've done is we created a method of taking a single uh, power transformer and using it for everything, the preamp stage, the power stage, and keeping as much of the power supply dual mono so that we have a stage, a side for the left channel and a side for the right channel. What that gives us is as good a separation of the electronics at the power supply stage because remember so much about what makes our um, makes an amplifier work think of an amplifier as um, in its simplest terms as as a as a plug that you put in the wall and you put a very complex series of valves on that power supply <laughs> And then you connect it up to your speakers. Now, don't do any version of that at home. Caution, this can be dangerous. <laughs> but that's, that's in its very simplest terms what it is. So um, putting a lot of energy, a lot of design time, and a lot of thought into the topology of the power supply can really make huge improvements and benefits sonically. I know it sounds a little counterintuitive, but when you hear one of our kit amps, you'll know what I'm talking about right away and of course mainline manufacturers don't do things like that because it costs a lot of money to do it that way okay well a couple of really good tubes came in this week and one of our favorite 12ax7s a whole bunch of them came in used well they're testing new old stock but they they may be poles i'm not 100 percent sure uh, so they're in the store and they're being priced as used tubes, of course. And that, of course, is the, the Matsushita 12AX7s. This is, uh, along with the RFT 12AX7, this is Charles's, one of Charles's favorite 12AX7s. He loves the warm, rich mid-range. And, of course, the uh, Matsushita tooling was supplied by Mullard. So it's not surprising that it's a, it's a warm, rich-sounding 12AX7 because the the true vintage Mullard um, is like that. And some of these tubes flash on startup. We call that the Mullard flash. <laughs> and all that is is just a little exposed portion of the filament um, down here has a different resistance. And when the current hits the filament, it gives a little bright flash. Not all of them flash, and not all of them flash that brightly. But it just goes to show you that some of these actually were made uh, even following 
Um, you know, even though the design is very much the Muller design and the tooling is the Muller tooling, the, the components themselves, the raw materials probably were all sourced in Japan, so it's not exactly the same tube. Um, and that's the tubes that are uh, manufactured under um, uh, license or contract by different plants are never the same as the original tube. Often they're close, but it's the original tube that, well, is the unique and original tube. Anyways, uh, enough of these came in. I've got some pairs in the store and they're a good price because they're good used tubes. And um, another uh, a whole bunch of Matsushita's came in. Now this is the 6FQ7, but of course, as we said earlier, it's actually, today we call that the 6CG7. And they are all new old stock, new in the box. They're new in the shrink. The Some <clears throat> Japanese, quite a few Japanese manufacturers actually put a shrink with sort of, sort of like a, an old cigarette package. I think maybe they still shrink them like that. Anyway, so you don't see too many smokers around here. So um, anyways, um, yeah. So you pull the rip cord and pull the shrink off. These are beautiful tubes. And remember I was talking earlier about cleaning pins. Well, these, these literally, I just opened these this morning. They were brand new in the box, in the shrink. So they haven't been touched for 40 years, 50 years. And look at the pins, they're corroded. So these will clean up, uh, we'll clean them up, of course, until they're bright and clean. And they'll be just like brand new, like they were. But it just goes to show you that um, oxidization and corrosion can happen even on a tube that's um, even sitting inside of a plastic envelope. It just happens that way. And these are beautiful sounding tubes. The Toshibas um, probably went out a little bit on finer detail, particularly in the mid-range. But Charles says these have an amazing, uh, really lovely, uh, warm mid-range that he says that these compete quite favorably with the Toshibas. And it's tough to find um, good uh, vintage Japanese tubes. Um, there's, there's just not that many around. So when we do find them, it's, it's a day for celebration. And we found, I, I shouldn't say we, because <laughs> Charles is the expert. He's really good at finding um, certain tube types he specializes in. And he found a whole bunch of these. So there's a bunch of uh, new old stock ones in the store for the Matsushitas. Um, and if you've stayed this long and you haven't fallen asleep, I know it's a lot more interesting when Charles is here because we can chat back and forth a bit. Here's some discount codes to help you out. And there's a hidden code that people get, costs us money, and I'm always glad to see viewers grabbing discounts and returning customers. And we can reach almost everybody around the world for a flat rate $20 shipping. And if your order is $150 or more after discount, the shipping's on us. This is Jim, missing Charles, who will be back soon, I hope. <laughs> Take care, everyone.